From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 172, recorded on June 11th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniel, and joining me here in New York City, Dixon Despommier. Hello there, Vincent. And from a remote location, Daniel Griffin. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hey, Daniel. It's a beautiful day. Gorgeous. And yesterday was not. No. It was in fact, soupy. it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it was soupy. Ask me how bad it was. How bad was it? It was so bad that if you were a helicopter pilot, you were really in danger of not even seeing the buildings, and one of them actually crashed into the roof of a building yesterday and died. Why did he crash? Why did he crash? And what happened? Did something break? Did he make we, a mistake? I have no data on that part of it. I just know that the story was that he had just dropped off a customer to their destination and mm-hmm. it was going back to wherever he came from. And uh, He hit a building? He he crashed on the roof of a building. And in fact, this, the fuel spilled out of the helicopter and they had to put out a fire. Could have really been horrible. I mean, it was horrible anyway, but it could have been even worse. And of course, then people started to angst over 9-11 because, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't know what's happening until you get the full story. You know, many helicopter pilots are former Vietnam vets Mm -hmm. because they were very good helicopter pilots there. And I wonder if he was one or that, 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 that war is fading in the distance. It is. And so many of these pilots, I think, are of retirement age. Mm-hmm. Did you fight in the war, Dixon? Uh, no, Vincent. I was born, <laughs> dare we say this again, in, two, in 1940. 1940. I was born in June 5th, 1940, <laughs> uh, one day before D-Day, actually. Ah, that's for right. me, D-Day was June 5th. <laughs> for everybody else, it wasn't. <laughs> Happy birthday, Dixon. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. And Happy birthday birthday we cannot remember to that. To you, right? you belong in a lab. <laughs> You look like a trichinella, and you taste like one, too. Mm. Wasn't that a great variation on that? It's a free verse, free verse. All right. Sorry about that. Roses are red, violets are blue, I'm schizophrenic, (laughs) and so am I. (laughs) You know that one? To the science guys. (laughs) We have a couple of follow-ups. First is from Kevin about mitochondrial DNA discussed in 171, Mm -hmm. the hair of the dogmatism that bit me. Your discussion of amoebophora and the dinoflagellates during TWIP-171 implied that transmission of mitochondrial DNA was exclusively maternal. Though not usually a big fan of Father's Day, in deference to this seasonal potlatch, I would like to raise a quibble, not a snippet, regarding this dogmatic statement, which I generally I agree with. I think a nod to paternal leakage, such degrading nomenclature, is in order here. Paternal de- mitochondrial DNA transmission inheritance is not uncommon among certain muscles, so that I am not accused of beating a dead mitochondria. <laughs> I will leave off almost with Nature Magazine News and Views, 14 January 2019. Mitochondrial DNA can be inherited from fathers, not just mothers. Mm-hmm. As the adage goes, shit happens. Arg. The TWIP team are always first to point out the exceptions to the rules, and for that I am grateful. P.S. As a demonstrate of my long-term interest in mitochondria, I direct your attention to my letter to science dated 29th July 1988, Mitochondria in Sperm. And he writes, in Gene L. Marx's article, Multiplying Genes by Leaps and Bound, Bounds, Research News, 10th June, page 1408, the mm-hmm. indefatigable, mm-hmm. no, indefatigable? Thank you. That's a word I don't say very often. (laughs) Indefatigable long-distance swimmers, the spermatozoa, are described as bereft of mitochondrial DNA. Please reassure my gametes that this is incorrect. Kevin Carney, University of Illinois Hospitals and Clinics. Response. Carney's gametes can be reassured (laughs) that they do have mitochondria. (laughs) I regret it if my error caused them any concern. Gene L. Marks. That's an interesting correspondence. So, so you, it has a nabincorn. Is that the remnant or the, the the transmogrification of a normal mitochondrion? What? You know the neck of the neck of the sperm. Yeah, they're full of mitochondria. That's nabincorn. It's called the nabincorn. Yeah. So that the, our, our sperm 
do have mitochondria, but they do not contribute to the uh, next cell. No. Um, only the, the mitochondria from mm-hmm. from the eggs do. Now, this is the case for most organisms. And Kevin is right. Certain muscles was pointed out in January, but I just didn't think it was important to mention that. However, it just goes to show that um, people are listening. Yeah, I was going to I was going to jump in there and say, you know, so it's interesting when you talk about, um, you know, we sort of have this. Well, I don't know if we sort of, but I have this idea that there's male and female of a lot of different organisms. And I know we've talked in the past about there was a gentleman who was in the in the lab uh, working among us, uh, Michael, and he was he had been studying transmissible cancer in um, in bivalves. Right. Yep. Basically, um, you know. Things, things that have two shells, so bivalves, so the two shell animals. And, you know, I, I remember one point we were talking and there was this whole issue that how do you know that this cancer developed in, in that bivalve versus the, the cancer was transmitted it to it by another bivalve? And I, I at the time, you know, thought I, I had a very simple solution to this. And I say, you know, Michael, why don't we just uh, type the cancer and basically see if it's a male or a female cancer, you know, like the XY type thing we think of in humans. Mm-hmm. And then we'll just, you know, if, if all the, you know, if all the, if all the cancers are, let's say female, and then we every so often see a male that got it, well, obviously it didn't develop in them because it's not like your cells would switch um, sex inside you. Mm. And it actually turns out it's kind of complicated, the whole issue of sexes in the bivalves. Mm. And so some, some bivalves have male and female, some they're hermaphroditic, I mean, in a lot of cases, the reproduction is external. Um, some people think you can tell a male from a female uh, muscle by this orange thing at the edge. Uh, so actually, it, it turned into this whole big thing. And in the particular species of bivalve he was studying, the the issue of being able to differentiate male from female from hermaphroditic had not been worked out yet. So, hmm. so my, my what I thought was going to be a simple solution turned into uh, <laughs> not so simple. Right. Not so simple. And certainly not a solution. <laughs> yeah, it was not a solution. <laughs> Dixon, can you take sure. the next one, please? Sue Ellen, Sue Ellen writes, Thanks to Dixon de Pommier for totally setting off my hypochondria detector with his story of the dressage riders in Massachusetts who all got toxoplasmosis uh, from their indoor arena. <clears throat> I think... It wasn't in Massachusetts. I think it was in California, but I'm not 99% sure of that one. Isn't a horse a horse, Dixon? A horse is a horse is a horse. Horse. That's right. Uh, I bored. (laughs) Would anybody like to mention Mr. Ed while I keep going? Uh, I bored at a barn in Canton, Georgia, where we have an indoor arena. And when I first moved my horses there five years ago, the arena was in pretty rough shape. Of course, I didn't know at the time. But after I got pneumonia twice in two years, my husband started suggesting that maybe the dust in the arena was making me sick. I, of course, poo-pooed the, that idea, but that's <laughs> that's not a play on words either, but that may be actually what caused it. But two years ago, we got new footing in the arena, and lo and behold, no more pneumonia. Way less dust in the air. The old owner <clears throat> had never cleaned up the manure in the arena, which I now know is both bad for the footing and for the lungs of both horses and riders. The new owners keep the arena pretty pristine, so yay for that. But still, that hypochondriac warning system is buzzing in my head. Could I have contracted Toxo during those bad years? Could my horse? Could my fellow riders? Yikes! How would I know before I embarrass myself with both my own doctor and my horse's veterinarian, I'd like to get some more info from Drs. Griffin and DePommier. Not a diagnosis, naturally, but at least maybe discuss what the risk is of aspirating, uh, asp- aspirating, aspirating, yes, and inhaling cat-slash-dog-slash-horse feces. How likely is it that someone would contract toxo from such aspiration? I never heard of that happening except in Dixon's anecdote. But now I'm worried. Until I know better, my dressage costume will be helmet, boots, gloves, mask, and maybe a respirator. <laughs> Love your show, Sue Ellen, in Roswell, Georgia. But by the way, a PS, she has a PS to this, so he won't answer her question right away. So we go to the PS. Hey, after sending this, I realized that you guys really don't know me that well. And they might sound a bit hysterical in that email. I'm not. My question is a valid one. 
What is the risk of contracting something like toxo from aspirating feces? But most of the rest is hyperbole. I promise I'm not wearing a mask and respirator when I ride. It's too hot in here. I'm not totally freaked out. Just my usual over-the-top way of communicating. So the answer is that the, 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 the incident that I have in mind not only had an indoor dressage unit, but it had a huge amount of hay piled up in the back of the uh, arena. And in that hay were tons of mice. <clears throat> so as a result, the owners of the indoor arena decided to hire cats to get rid of the mice. And that's what caused the problem because cats excrete the oocysts in their feces <clears throat> and they're resistant to drying. And <clears throat> indeed, a enough of them survived to allow a number of writers to actually become um, infected. Well, here's an article in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. What year, may I ask? 2016. Really? The title is Follow-Up of the 1977 Georgia Outbreak it's a Georgia of outbreak. Toxoplasmosis. A Georgia Outbreak. In 1977, an outbreak of toxo occurred among 37 persons associated with exposure to an indoor horse arena. That's the one I was referring to. I'm Cat sorry. feces containing the organism was <clears throat> most likely stirred up when horses ran on the dirt floor and were right. inhaled. After right. 25 years, we attempted to locate people from the outbreak, give them an eye exam. Of 37 oh. people in the outbreak, 18 were located, four had died, and the remaining 14 agreed. Among the 14, three were found to have eye lesions typical of toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis. Wow. So... Wow, I'm sorry will, about the, the state, but uh, so Georgia, that's <laughs> that's that's where this woman is writing us from. So yeah, so I'm so some... Ellen, I'm going to put a link to that article in the show notes, mm -hmm. and uh, I I just searched for you know toxoplasmosis horse arena, right, and I found that was the Bingo. top one. Bingo. Um, I remember when oh. I first heard about it, I I was incredulous, but then I heard about another one which was even more incredulous, and that was the fact that. In California, I know this one occurred in California on the Monterey Peninsula. The um, feral cats that run loose on the farmland mm -hmm. uh, deposit their feces, of course, in the, on the soil. And then when it rains heavily, that soil washes down into the bay. And guess what? The filter feeders in the bay pick up the oocysts, namely snails. And because the abalone have been cleaned out by people that thought that was good to eat in addition so did the uh, the otters the sea otters did too but then they were left with nothing else to eat except snails guess what they started dying of toxoplasmosis mm. because they were eating the snails that were filtering the water that was put there by cat feces right so lots of things are connected uh, in ways that I'd we like don't to like to hear da daniel weigh in on this sure uh, i was gonna say a couple things one is i'm a big fan of hypochondriac so never apologize for being one That's, <laughs> consider that a plus um <laughs> the the second i'll say is that you know as dixon describes it um you have this situation where toxo can it be a acquired through aspiration. Um, I remember a few years back when we were going through our parasites and, and I think um, Dixon and Chuck Kinnersh and I were talking, we're like, hey, really not a lot of uh, aspiration, not a lot of inhalation going on with parasites in general, but Toxo is um, mm -hmm. one of the ones where it's clearly been documented multiple times. And it, it is this kind of a situation. You need a feline, you know, somewhere in the system, right? If you have horses all by themselves, if you don't have cats, you're going to be fine. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you say, boy, you know, is there a huge risk if I inhale and we get a list of different types of feces. It's the cat feces that's the issue here. Right. If you live in a cat-free environment um, and you're, you're breathing in some dog and horse feces, it's a little bit safer. Not that I'm going to encourage or recommend that. Um, <laughs> but and when, she, when she was poo-pooing the idea... That's, I thought of maybe that as a yeah, maybe there play was on words or something, but uh, <laughs> perhaps not. <laughs> yeah, there was something there. Um, and, you know, it's mainly in the feces. But remember the is, letter before that, excuse me, the, the letter before that said that shit happened. So that, that's yes, got to be exact, tied exactly. to this one. <laughs> Um, and as we talk, it's mainly in the cat feces, but interesting enough, in some of the studies in California, because there's this environmental impact on the otter population, you can get some oocysts in the cat urine as well. So you're not safe if you just decide, oh, I'll switch over to breathing in cat urine. Um, the other thing I'll throw in here is, you know, this question of, well, how do I know if I got it? Oh, my gosh. Um, in general, 
we've mentioned that in Brazil, in France, 80% of the population by the yep. time they're adults have, have been infected. And, right. you know, it's just in France and people are doing fine. Um, in general, it's the rare exception that people have issues with toxo. Um, but then I'm going to take a second step here and I'm going to say, um, you know, you could go, you can get a blood test. You could find out, um, do you have specific immunoglobulin of the IgG subclass? You know, and if, if you have those, um, then... Um, you know, you've, you've been infected sometime in the past. Right. Um, but here's the other thing is, well, what about eye involvement? Um, I'm going to do two things here. There was a study in Brazil where there's one of these really high incidents and probably somewhere between 10, 10 to 20 percent. If you do a really careful photographic funding exam, mm. um, you will actually see some evidence of mm. uh, ocular toxo, but it is very rare for that actually to give you um, symptoms the way I think we've discussed the way sometimes people can actually develop mm. uh, issues with their vision. The other is, well, well, does Sue Ellen, Sue Ellen, do you, do you need to worry? Um, the issue potentially in the future, if there is immune suppression, um, mm. then, and, you know, so this has been a huge issue in our um, HIV and our AIDS population where, you know, you're infected, everything's fine, your body's taking care of it, you got through what might be an acute mono-like illness, which means maybe sore throat, maybe swollen lymph nodes, a little fever, you got better after a period of time, um, and then you thought it was all over, but when the immune system goes down, the toxo can reactivate. In that case, it's usually within the brain, and you can actually have mass um, effects. Mm. So, Sue Allen could become immunosuppressed, like for a transplant, organ transplant, or some infection. Just getting old. Yeah, yeah. Of course, if if she does turn out to be IgG positive, it doesn't mean that she got it from the horse arena. It no. could be something else. That's right. right. So no, and that's actually that's actually true. It'd be very all you can say is, "Boy, I yeah, got infected yeah. Yeah. more and, than three weeks ago," but who knows when? And it's more likely that it would be through um, eating less than well-cooked meat, I would say. So in France, they certainly don't dressage. <laughs> so the thing is, 99% though, of the time. Mo most horse areas are associated with cats, right? Stables have plenty of yeah, cats. Yeah, I, I think that's the reason, though, because of the hay and the mice. That's that's the reason why that I don't is. know about the arenas themselves. If, although if it depends a, on the arrangement. You know, it really does. Yeah, if they there's store a stable the right next to the, right. The, the, the cats could come in at night and play, right? <laughs> <laughs> you mean while the mice are away, the cats play? <laughs> I, I think that's what happens, right? <laughs> Once the horses go away, they're not afraid of being stepped on. Mm. All know. right. Very I good. Know. I think the um, respirator mask is a good idea. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of sociology associated with these parasitic infections, you know? It's really it's quite amazing. Well, actually. Sue Ellen, just put, a, put one of those masks on <laughs> and just see what your fellow horse riders say to you. <laughs> I don't think you want to wear it for very long. No. Would that do it? Would that be sufficient? You know, Probably. those loose fitting. Uh, Not loose. You mean like you do for. Um, dust. Dust when you're spraying paint or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Wouldn't be good. Would that stop? No. Probably not. I think, you, real, I think real respirator. you need to wear a yeah. full blown BSL 3. <laughs> I think that's the only way to do it, you know. We look good on a horse. Of course. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> All right, let's go to our case. Okay. Daniel, bring Certainly. us up to date. Now, for everybody uh, tuning in um, for the first time, or for those of you tuning back in, uh, on uh, our last TWIP, we presented the case of a, um, a young boy. He said he was less than 10 years old, and he was brought in by his mother, um, concerned about an ulcer on the leg that was painless. Uh, I actually showed Dixon a picture of this, and and he and I described this together, and said that it had a it had a hard nodular border. Uh, the ulcer itself was I'll say two to three centimeters, right? So to put that like a little inch, inch and a half, something like that. Mm. Uh, but then the border itself was also probably about half an inch or one to two centimeters around the edge. Um, he had originally been seen by the floating doctors um, a few months before, so so we are just a tell everyone we are we are at a remote location in 
Panama, and this is a community made up of the original indigenous um, Nobe people. And the floating doctors had set up a mobile clinic where he was seen initially when it was very early on. At that point, they weren't sure what it is, but now he comes back again, and the ulcer is still there. It's not healing. It still doesn't hurt. It's still open area, but does not look to be um, purulent or any kind of extra infection. Mm-hmm. Um, the area around, we spent a little time again. It was hard. It was a slightly different color than the surrounding tissue. Um, and then when you looked at the edge of the ulcer, it was not undermined. It was really just a, a, a mm-hmm. fixed border there. So mm-hmm. that was what we had to say. That is what we had to say. All right. Daniel, can you take that first guess? Certainly. Ben writes, dear metacyclic twipo mastigotes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> to borrow one of Dixon's commonly used terms, this lesion sounds pathognomonic for cutaneous leishmaniasis. I would guess leishmania panamensis because of the location, although it isn't clear to me how well the distribution of these parasites corresponds with the countries they are named after. Mm-hmm. The mother definitely should be concerned about this ulcer mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. L. panamensis has the capacity to cause mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. Diagnosis in this location, I assume, would be my microscopy. I would guess that the best drug for treatment of the child would be paromamycin, either orally or injected, but not topical due to the ability of L. panamensis to cause mucocutaneous disease. Something that has always confused me about the pathology of leash mania is that the parasites are only found at the border of the lesion. As I understand it, the parasite infects the cells at the site of the sandfly bite, infecting cells and radiating the outwards to find more permissive cells. If this is the case, what kind of cells do you find in the center of the lesion? <laughs> do you only find cells that leishmania cannot infect? If you find cells that leishmania can infect, what advantage might the parasite get from replicating only at the border of the lesion? I've taken a weekend twip across the English <laughs> Channel, and I'm currently in surprisingly sunny London, where it is 22C. Hmm. May your successful system continue to attract parasites like myself. Regards, Ben. And, uh, and then he makes a paper suggestion. Hmm. He says, the authors show that an increase of erythrocyte cholesterol content inhibits the ability of P. falciparum myrozoites to invade them, but serum hypercholesterolemia does not alter invasion. And it gives us a link. Mm -hmm. And Ben is a PhD candidate in the uh, Wilson lab. It's a malaria biology lab um, at the University of Adelaide. And that's Research Center for Infectious Diseases School of Biological Sciences. Mm -hmm. All right. Larry writes, greetings. This is my first guess on a case. Not sure whether this is cheating, but I took a painless shortcut. (laughs) The description of the boy's leg lesion as painless seemed like a giveaway. I searched parasitic diseases and found painless in two sections. In African trypanosomiasis, large painless shonkers are discussed, but this doesn't seem like a good fit for the boy in Panama, both because of geography and because his lesion was described as crater form with a hard nodular border. The other painless lesion discussed in PD occurs in cutaneous leishmaniasis. This lesion is described as a large ulcer with a raised, hardened edge. Exactly like the description of the boy's lesion, leishmania is endemic to the region where the boy lives, and he probably is exposed to sand flies at the times of day they are active. PD cautions that there are many other dermatological conditions that might be mistaken for cutaneous leishmaniasis. If nucleic acid amplification testing is possible in this very remote location, then that's the best diagnostic approach, but it also might be possible to see the amastigotes by microscopy of a scraping of the healthy tissue adjacent to the lesion. If leishmania is present, Treatment might be appropriate even though cutaneous leishmaniasis lesions normally heal spontaneously. Without treatment, there's a chance that mucocutaneous leishmaniasis can develop because the lesion has been around for at least a few months. I wonder whether the boy is somewhat immunosuppressed, perhaps from malnutrition or another infectious disease. This would increase his risk for developing MCL. Because the lesion was described as 2 to 3 centimeters, 
I think it can be treated by intralesional injection of pentavalent antimony if the boy can be persuaded to tolerate the procedure. Mm. Now, this is going to hurt. I'm a little concerned that I'm guessing an organism that is referred to in the first word of the TWIP 171 program notes, <laughs> but the description mm. certainly seems to fit. Thank you, TWIP team, for setting the standard for excellence in science podcasting. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> Don't you, gentlemen? Of course. That's very flattering. Thanks yes. very much. Kendra writes, Hello, TWIP professors. My guess for TWIP 171 is cutaneous leishmaniasis. Cutaneous leishmaniasis is transmitted by sandflies. While feeding, a sandfly injects the leishmania species parasite into the host. The specific species of leishmania should be identified prior to treatment. A treatment decision should only be made after species identification to prevent toxicity. The species can be diagnosed by nucleic acid amplification testing. There are several different treatment options, such as cryotherapy, liposomal amphotericin B, miltifacine, and azoles. Differential um, includes uh, leprosy, paracoccidioidomycosis, blastomycosis, histoplasmosis, sarcoidosis, cutaneous tuberculosis, squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, and basal cell carcinoma. Best, Kendra. And she refers to our book. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Daniel. Uh, Chris writes, greeting Twipsters, the persistent <clears throat> crater form lesion described in this case immediate brings to mind cutaneous leishmaniasis. The lesion is also non-tender, which is expected for the infection site, unless it happens to be near a joint or has become painful with secondary bacterial infection. A confirm confirmatory diagnosis could be made by scraping a sample from the margin of the lesion, which would contain live parasites, and either culturing the parasites or testing with PCR. Given the location and available resources, however, the diagnosis may be clear enough not to require confirmation. Dogs serve as a common reservoir, so it's likely the patient acquired this infection from a sandfly that had previously fed on an infected dog. Treatment seems to depend heavily on the clinician's assessment of the case. Drug therapy can be used, including pentavalent antimony, amphotericin B, and multifazine, but the infection often resolves without intervention and managing the lesion is all that's necessary. Looking forward to hearing some more details on how treatment is approached. Best, Chris from Athens, Georgia. Courtney writes, greetings from Omaha, Nebraska. I have a question regarding the possibilities of a cornea transplant in a young child. Would it be worth it if a child is in a developing country with limited medical care? I am not a medical person, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't the child need to be on immunosuppressants, or would the eyes still be considered immune-privileged after the attack from the parasite? Is that referring to last week's or last episode's? You know, we did a couple uh, episodes where we had eye involvement, mm -hmm. so... Um, right. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it's tough, actually, the, you know, we're in these areas where we talk about limited resources, or I say poorly distributed resources. Um, and, you know, when you're trying to help connect uh, the different people with the available resources, um, the idea of a corneal transplant in a young child um, in this kind of a setting can can be quite something. Mm -hmm. uh, but you so, know, there's no vascularization, though, is there in the cornea? So why would you have to worry about rejection? No, no, I, I don't believe you do. And um, I don't believe you actually require um, no. anti-rejection medicine after a corneal transplant. Right. I've never heard of that associated with it either. No. All right. Continuing. My guess for this week, subcutaneous leishmaniasis. I utilized PD 7th edition. There's a terrific table in the appendix, page 578, that lists symptoms and common diseases associated with it. There were only three listed under ulcer. Leishmaniasis, Dracunculus, Grinny Worm, and Trypanosomiasis. Trypanosomiasis has many symptoms that were not listed. Granted, some of these symptoms may take weeks to months to appear depending upon the subspecies. Diagnosis for Dracunculus is done via finding the Guinea Worm, and that was not mentioned in the podcast. So this is a possibility. However, I go with Leishmaniasis because it is a clean ulcer and not painful. Daniel or Dixon did some fishing and asked if there were insects present, and leishmaniasis is spread 
via sand fly, whereas Dracunculus is done via crustacean. Daniel also mentions traveling by boat, which is how he gets to some villages in Panama. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I admire all three of you, and I hope I'm half as productive as all three of y'all. <laughs> that was very nice of him y'all. to say that. All right, Dixon, you get the big. I get the biggie. Kahuna. I do. I do. And this is this is always good to read. Kevin writes. Rural Panamanian child with a painless solitary lower leg ulceration of several months duration. Ulcer base is firm and clean. Ulcer border is indurated and elevated. Child is otherwise well appearing. Now, I have to close something over here. Otherwise, I'm going to... Ah, good. Um, I remember an old dermatological text that stressed an anatomic approach to dermatological uh, diagnosis. The end papers of this text had a front and back illustration of a person festooned with various lesions. It was an attempt to make sense of the often confounding nature of skin disease diagnosis. I recall this geographic approach to diagnosis when I first listened to to Case 171. My attempts to find well-documented reports on lesion localization uh, in parens or ulcer site preference in American... um, Tegumentary leishmaniasis? Or do you say... Um, Tegumentary. Yes, I said that's what I thought. That's what I said. <laughs> I said you say New World Cutaneous Leishmaniasis. We're not very successful. More on that later. The solitary nature of our patient's lesion, the size, appearance, Central American location, and natural history are all typical of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Egg leg ulcers, common in the United States, are usually seen in adults and often due to varicose stasis or arterial disease. A laundry list differential that does not really fit our case may include yaws, not reported from Panama since the 1980s, myiasis, shagoma, cutaneous amoebiasis, pyoderma gangrenosum, necrobiosis, necrobiosis, lipodicia. Do you know what that is, Daniel? What is that? The necrobiosis lipoidica. Yeah, what is that? What is that? Um, So the different, and I think this is helpful, the different layers of the skin. So this is actually going to be, we have necrosis of the the lipid layer below below the skin. And you end up, um, this can happen for a couple different reasons. Um, Often it can be an autoimmune issue. There are certain infections, but you actually end up with really a depression where the skin sort of drops in. Yeah, not and he, great. And he continues. Carcinoma and Beckett's disease? Bechet. Bechet's? Okay. Bechet. Bechet. And, and what is that disease? <laughs> um, so <laughs> that, <laughs> that's also going to be um, uh, use, often autoimmune. And the, the person will develop these painful ulcers in various places. They might be in the mouth. They might be in the genital I regions. I see. Um, so often someone will send them to me thinking, oh, my gosh, this person just keeps getting um, re- recurrent um sexually transmitted infections. Mm. Uh, I saw a case of this recently. You know, we often can treat treat it with colchicine, things like that. So it's where the ID doc steps in with Mm. these we call mimics. Got it. Okay, it continues. In old world cutaneous leishmaniasis, 48% of the lesions were located on the head and neck with only 0.4% located on the legs. That's referenced ESCOV 2016. A case series of 43 adult patients in Brazil, Saldanha, in 2017, reports lower limb lesions in 86% of studied patients. Schubach, in 2015, in a case series of 151 Brazilian patients, showed that 70% of the lesions were solitary and 26% had lesions on the legs and feet. Torres Guerrero, 2017, reported that in a Guatemalan case series, most that most, 43% of ulcers were on the upper extremities. The Gonzalez 1918 case series, primarily Panamanian patients, also noted that 60% of ulcers were found on the upper extremities. I apologize for veering off on this lesion site location uh, tangent, a largely useless exercise at best. However, I do remember a recent TWIP, hmm, surf and perf, TWIP 163, <laughs> where there was a brief discussion of the feeble aerodynamic capabilities of the sandfly resulting in more bites on the lower extremities. Diagnosis here is best achieved with uh, nuclear um, uh, NAAT. Other modes of diagnosis, culture, histopathology, 
touch preps, though lesions may resolve after several months. Some remain chronic. Treatment of solitary lesions is usually local with the use of cryotherapy, uh, topical paromomycin, or intralesional pentavalent antimony. Skin lesions, especially facial, are socially stigmatizing, which is another reason for treatment, in addition to prevention of scarring due to chronic lesions. <clears throat> Systemic treatment is reserved for patients at risk for development of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. According to Dutari, 2014, Leishmania viana brasiliensis, the principal cause of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, MCL, has not been isolated from infection in Panama. I was unable to find incidence rates and occurrence rates of MCL in Panama uh, that would appreciate the TWIP host's comments on MCL. Thanks for a great podcast. That's high praise coming from Kevin, because he is obviously encyclopedic in his knowledge. And we, we're not an encyclopedia. I don't think we're going to read a terminal curiosity, please. Sure. Oh, well, that's all of it? Okay, fine. Well, no, it's two paragraphs. A terminal, it's called a terminal curiosity. You cruise down to it. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have to read all of it. Those right. are the references. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. A terminal curiosity. While we are broadly, or at least superficially, on the topic of dermatology, I would like to include a quotation from an old dermatology text. A co-author of the text is Robert Willem, 1757 to 1812, regarded as the founder of the discipline of dermatology. He was influenced by Linnaeus and attempted a taxonomic classification of skin diseases, a curious and largely ab abandoned system. Mm -hmm. The book, A Practical Synopsis of Cutaneous Diseases According to the Arrangement of Dr. Willen, Thomas Bateman, Robert Willen, Anthony Todd Thomas, 8th edition, London, Longman, 1836, is available free on Google Books. What I find particularly amusing about 18th century English medical writing is the manner in which the author freely trash other physicians, <laughs> quacks, pharmacists, etc. An example of such trolling um, avant la lettre is quoted below. M. Albert, with loud pretensions to superior skill and much vaulting, of the services which he has rendered in this department of medicine has, in fact, contributed nothing to the elucidation of the obscurity in which it is veiled. The merit of his publication belongs principally to the artists whom he has had good fortune to employ, <laughs> for he has adopted the ancient confusion of terms without a single definition to fix their acceptation. And he has not scrupled to borrow the nomenclature of the vulgar in its most vague and indeterminate sense, in quotes. Hmm. We don't write like that anymore. You know what? I'm glad no one said that to me because I wouldn't have understood a word they said. I wouldn't have been insulted until I had to look up some of these terms. Cool. Yeah. Daniel. Yes, Christopher writes. I'm still enjoying that last little section. Indeed. <laughs> Although I wish I could write like that, I would still probably huh. not not be able to. I, I've been raised to be too polite. Uh, hello, Christopher writes. Hello, hosts. <laughs> For this week's case, I would say that one, cutaneous leishmaniasis, which would have been transmitted by the bite of a sandfly, you can identify this lesion using a light microscope in which you would want to scrape the edge of the lesion with a scalpel to obtain the parasite. According to Parasitic Diseases 7, I like that people are mm -hmm. moving to 7, this lesion could probably be just left alone and heal itself in time. And because it's only on his leg, the scar probably won't impact his life too much. Mm. And then here, minor oceanography misunderstanding. <laughs> iron does not control plankton blooms on the coast, but iron does control plankton in more oligotrophic ecosystems, such as the Southern Ocean and ocean gyres. These systems are known as high nutrient, low chlorophyll regions, so HNLC, hmm. as they have a high abundance of what is normally the limiting nutrient, mainly nitrogen, but are limited by iron. There were some really cool experiments done in the 1990s uh, where they proved this, and we actually get some reference there, definitely worth the read. Yep. In general, the coast systems are limited by nitrogen, which since the invention uh -huh. of fertilizer and the massive amounts of runoff due right, to the excessive use sense. of fertilizer yeah, sure. have created numerous 
dead zones in our oceans, such as the massive dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So right. just a minor correction to Dixon's statement last episode. Wrong again, as usual. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> we still love you, Dixon. Um, and it's I okay. say they're predicting a huge dead zone um, this summer in the yeah, uh, Gulf. That, oh, my God, because of all the flooding of the farmland in the Midwest. Absolutely correct. Run off. Oh, my gosh, mm. yes. Oh, just an enormous. It's not over yet. It's been going on since April. And here he taught parasitology heroes. I think I speak for all mm-hmm. TWIP listeners when I say that three parasitology heroes that very much deserve to be added to the hero section of the new book are Uh-oh. Vincent Racaniello, Dixon de Pommier, and Daniel Griffin for their countless hours and efforts in educating the public about parasites, helping create and spread the most up-to-date inclusive and formative free textbook on human parasites and their own numerous contributions to the field. These three heroes have greatly contributed to the field by producing 171 lectures on current literature, educating tens of thousands of people all over the planet and for their notable individual contributions. Dixon and his research, Vincent in starting the podcast and pushing it forward, and Daniel for helping people all over the planet and his research, as well as the websites all three of them maintain with important information and the outreach events they all participate in. I could go on for hours and the countless contributions, but I'm trying to keep this email shorter. In terms of parasitology education, these three have probably taught more people about parasitology than any other parasitologist ever. And for that alone, I believe Hmm. all three deserve the title of parasitology heroes. Lastly, attached below is a cool video of Sir Caria pulled from his (laughs) mail this week that I thought you all would enjoy. Thanks for the great show. Warm regards, Christopher. Brianick, and he is at um, the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, Stony Brook right. University, right. Stony Brook, New York, just right down the road from, that's, from us. That's lovely. Did you see the so video, much. Dixon? Sorry. No, cool. I have not seen the video. I, I will look at it, though. I promise I will. It's beautiful. Cercaria. They're, they're fantastic to watch, by the way. Very really flexuous. Are. Yeah, they are. I didn't realize that. He pulled them from a snail. Pulled them from a snail. Taylor writes... Well, thank you. No, no. But first, let me just say thank you for the accolades. Well, the kudos. I, that's right. I, I don't think I'm a parasitology yeah. hero. You guys are. Actually, you know, Vincent, you study viruses. Those are the world's smallest and most sin- and, and, and sinister. You know, they all say parasites. nobody gets awards for teaching. You know, that's the way it is. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, it's okay. But I appreciate the the sentiment. It's lovely. Right. Very nice. I totally agree. Chris Taylor writes, "Dear Leishmaniacs." Long-time listener, first-time answerer. I'll start with a big thank you for putting on this amazing podcast and writing a wonderful and open-access textbook. I imagine you will get a lot of answers along the same line as mine, so I'll be brief. I believe the child has cutaneous leishmaniasis caused by a leishmania parasite, possibly L. panamensis or less likely L. columbiensis. Diagnosis should be made by microscopic examination, of infected tissues, and then biochemical molecular testing for specific species identification. On a side note, when I listen to TWIP, I try to imagine myself seeing the patient in clinic without knowing a parasite is the culprit. With that in mind, I try to come up with a non-parasitic diagnosis. My non-parasitic diagnosis from most likely to least mucocutaneous paracoccidiomycosis caused by Paracoccidioides brasiliensis, can have skin and ulcerations in endemic in Panama, I think, but this is TWIP. <laughs> Cutaneous sporotrichosis, caused by sporothric schenke sensulato, again can cause skin ulceration, seems endemic in Panama, but this is TWIP. <laughs> Tropical ulcer, usually polymicrobial with fusobacterium ulcerans, common but typically painful Mm -hmm. and demonstrates undetermined border. This case does not. Beruli ulcer, caused by mycobacterium ulcerans, often in children, often in the lower extremity. I don't see the Americas represented on the list of actively reporting countries by the WHO. Mm -hmm. Bijal, yaws, and pinta, caused by endemic subspecies of treponema pallidum. Primary stage is nodular, but secondary stage can have painless ulcerations, but I would expect them to be more widespread than in this case. Also, in Panama, I would expect pinta, but that one shouldn't ulcerate from what I've read. 
Mm. There are other causes of painless ulcers that are not infectious in origin, but those are boring, so I won't list them. (laughs) (laughs) Also, I wouldn't expect most of them in a child this young. Mm. I'd love to know if Dr. Griffin has other ID etiologies on his diagnosis that I missed. Kind regards, Taylor in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Nice. And that there we have it. People a are nice, and thinking. A and, nice uh, assembly of guesses. Lovely, lovely, absolutely. And I think two of them um, have not had a book before, but we'll wait till <laughs> later to deal with that. I mean, we've saturated the market almost <laughs> of the writers, anyway. Wow. <laughs> Although you know, today there are two people who had never written before. So right, that's good. It's good. All right, Daniel, what do we got here? Uh, well, I think we have two more people that still need to guess. Uh, you mean the other two <laughs> parasite heroes? <laughs> yes, yes, parasite heroes. Do you have ideas? <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of ideas. All of them bad. No, that's not true. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll go first this time. Uh, although I know Vincent usually does, but uh, I, I don't think there's a question as to what the diagnosis is. It's a it's a ulcer caused by Leishmania. Mm-hmm. Now, which Leishmania? That's the trick because of the uh, crossover between. Um, cutaneous and mucocutaneous and so that for that you need a definitive diagnosis and for that you need to identify its uh, genome and i doubt if there's a genome identification technology available where daniel was so you'd have to ship that off someplace and i'm not sure you'd alter the treatment much um, but that's up to the clinician to decide obviously once he uh, or she sees what the uh, situation is so I, i would agree with it's leishmaniasis the ulcer is definitely Leishmania. I wouldn't necessarily agree that the little kid caught it from a dog. He could have caught it directly from um, a sand fly that bit another person who was infected. And I'm not entirely sure of how long sand flies that are infected remain alive after they uh, become infected. But I don't think it's a matter of hours or days. I think it's perhaps a week or something like that. So they have plenty uh, of time. Yeah, you're you're right. Actually, sandfly life cycle is, is a matter of weeks. Um, yeah, so. that's what I thought. So, unlike mosquitoes that only live for about a week and a half after they uh, take their blood meals, but, but this little bugger can stay around for quite a while, and you know, eventually. Now, the question was raised: Why don't they bite in the middle of that lesion? And that's, I think, it's a wonderful question because it really uh, addresses the issue of which cell types are susceptible to this infection, right? And they infect only the cells of the reticular endothelial system. They don't infect skin cells. They don't infect subcutaneous, you know, dermatologic uh, skin cells. They infect probably dendritic cells, wandering macrophages, that sort of kind of cell. And um, when you look at what's going on in the middle of the lesion, those are all basically necrotic cells that have died as the result of maybe the avascularization of the fact that this thing becomes an ulcer. and uh, But the painlessness aspect of this is quite interesting also. You can have huge ulcers, and if the patient can't see the back of their back, they have no idea that they're there. Huge meaning how many inches? Oh, you can be... A couple inches? At least a couple of inches across. You have one on your back, Dixon. I do, actually. I do. No, I do. Did you know? No, but it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not what you think it is, though. It's a subcutaneous lesion that has nothing to do with infections. Okay. But uh, at any rate, they, they, so my guess is leishmaniasis. Yeah, I, I would agree. The crater form and the uh, yeah. it's painless um, with the raised edges, yeah, I would think so. And the, the Panamanian location. Now, Dixon... When the when the sandfly initially bites, mm-hmm. you're saying it injects. It, it does it have a proboscis? Oh, yeah, sure. And it's going in for a blood meal. Yep. And uh, as it's probing, it's releasing. That's right. The epimastigotes. Epimastigotes. That's right. Okay, and then we we have a lesion form, and then you're saying when other sandflies bite that person to pick up, there's no other reservoir. Is that correct? No, there are plenty of animal reservoirs. All right, there are animal for reservoirs. Yeah, but don't they just them. randomly bite anywhere? Do they bite the lesion? That's a good question. I mean, I they, there may be something that attracts them to that. But maybe the color of the lesion or something. I don't know. Daniel, any information on it? No, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, there there is a, they they tend to bite in that area around, and there there probably is a mechanics for why are they attracted there? Because if they were to yeah. bite like somewhere else, um, but you've probably noticed this. There's something common in insects. If you have an open wound, yes. where where do the insects go? And there's <laughs> 
they they go to that open wound. It's disgusting. Well, that's uh, my <laughs> is producing, it. but but maybe there's an uh, an increase in the heat uh, zone, right? Because the middle is necrotic, so it would be the temperature of that area would be less. The edge, however, since it's living material, would be warm. And maybe there's a because they have heat sensing devices also. Mosquitoes and other biting insects have them. So maybe they're attracted to the heat of the lesion rather than uh, anything else. Yeah, or some sort of off gassing, right? As we've talked about sometimes. Yeah, that's right. That's another possibility. As we speak, another guest has come in. Really? So let me read it. This Please. is from Cecilia. Oh. Dear doctors, I believe Dr. Griffin's patient suffers from cutaneous leishmaniasis. Well, when the patient was seen previously in the clinic, he probably had the red papule where he was bitten by the fly. Very good. Oh. The fly vector would have introduced the promastigote stage of the parasite. Promastigote, not after the okay. promastigote stage be- becomes the amastigote. The ulcer forms. Good. Uh, the ulcer has a raised border where the parasites are found. In your book, you describe several methods used for diagnosis, including that histology and culture. I'm curious how the diagnosis is made in such a remote location. Your previous description of the living conditions in that area would account for the presence of the reservoir host, dogs or rodents as well as Sandfly Vector. I would like to thank you for making your book, as well as the articles you feature each episode, available to us. I have really learned a lot from TWIP, as well as your other podcasts. I look forward to each new episode. Sincerely, Cecilia from St. Petersburg, Florida. Nice. Wow. And I, right. I, that's another new person I don't recognize. So now we have three look at that. candidates for a book. <laughs> you know, I was just looking at my email because I, 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 I don't know, I shouldn't have been because I should have been listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a... But uh, it popped right up. An interlude. Fortuitous, fortuitous. No, so I, I'm going to, you know, we're, we're all three of us, I think, are going to concur here. Um, this story was um, fairly compelling, all right? I mean, this has been going on for months. It's a non-healing. It's a painless right. lesion. Um, I will... You know, going through the emails a little bit backwards is, um, you know, there there are there is a differential for the non-healing ulcer, and so we often think about fungus, you know, endemic fungus in different areas, and so I appreciate that that it was sort of broadened to that. Um, I make the point of describing that the edge of the ulcer is not undermined, which steers us a little bit away from the Borrelia or the tropical ulcers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so burly ulcer are more of a more of an issue in Africa, Asia, less of an issue in this area of the world where uh, the child had the problem, um, and um, the and then the decision comes at this point, and I think Dixon, you touched on this is is how do you confirm the diagnosis? Do you need to confirm the diagnosis? What sort of are the resources here? Yeah, right. One of the one of the big questions um, that we don't really have an answer to that people are now trying to work on was somebody brought up like, well, so what are the incidents? Let's see a really nice um, map of where the different subspecies are mm-hmm. with or without mucocutaneous potential, because that would really help us. If we knew that we were in a region, um, and this is, I think, better defined in parts of South America, you'd say we are in an area where we're not seeing um, much in the way of mucocutaneous um, potential species. We can just treat this um, locally, topically, and not worry about it. Mm-hmm. it. We're in an area, for instance, let's say we have the Viana subspecies or Brazil, for instance. Then we're much more concerned and we're looking at a, a, a parental, a systemic treatment uh, so that we, we don't go on to get this horrible mucocutaneous uh, right. manifestation. Um, there has not been as much work done yet in the Panama area. And actually, there was a woman who was at Floating Doctors last time I was there who was putting together a grant proposal. Um, and what they want to do is start doing surveys in these areas and really getting a better geographical map among the no bay among the indigenous people um, with regards to what subspecies are there the next which really is critical is what is the incidence of mucocutaneous potential with this the subspecies that are found in this area because if it's less than one percent that's going to impact um resources versus let's say it's 10 20 30 percent um because right now we have these estimates but we don't have a tremendous denominator to know you know what percent of the cutaneous leishmaniasis cases are going to go on to have this um, horrible mucocutaneous potential everyone got that leishmania right they did it's very good they did 
You want a drum roll? <laughs> so actually, I found four people, four people who I haven't recognized as having received the book. Mm-hmm. And so we will pick a random number from one to four, right? Is that yes. the correct math? I Ready? So. <laughs> number one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's Larry, my first guess. Okay. okay, Larry, here's the drill. Right. Send your address to twip at microbe.tv. And uh, I don't know where you're from because you didn't give any cues here. Hmm. But if you're outside of the U.S., please supply a phone number because I need that for the mailing. And I am behind on mailing. Yes, I know. Some of you have one. I will get to it. And you're going to be getting a sixth edition autographed because I have, I don't know, about six or seven of those left. Right. My deep and sincere and heartfelt apologies for being tardy. Oh, it happens. I have no good excuse except it happens that it, as I, as Kevin said, shit happens. <laughs> That's about right. In parasitism, that it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, in life it happens. We have a very cool paper today. We do. And I, I just think this is how science is so cool. It's in science. It's right. published in Science Magazine. Transgenic metarhizium rapidly kills mosquitoes in a malaria endemic region of Burkina Faso. Right. And this uh, he, this paper, the first author is Brian Lovett, and we have an asterisk here. These authors contributed equally. So Brian Lovett and Etienne Bilgo contributed equally. And then we have uh, two corresponding authors, which are Abdullahi. Diabate and Raymond Saint Leger. Wow, this is so cool. What is a metarhizium, Daniel? Um, it, it's interesting. It is a it's a type of fungus which mosqui- um, which can infect mosquitoes, right? Which can infect mosquitoes, and uh, there's actually a whole. So it itself is actually, um, we'll say deleterious to the mosquitoes it, it has a negative impact right. in and of itself before you even mess or do any of this um, genetic manipulation as we're going to learn about yeah so it's a fungus that can infect mosquitoes it will make them um, it will decrease their numbers and impact their fecundity and so forth but it's not great so they wanted to it's improve. It's not enough. It's, it's not, not enough. enough. It's they not enough. To it's, not as, right. it's not as great as it could be. That's right. <laughs> you know, they wanted to try alternatives to pesticides. Right? Yes, that's right. And releasing genetically modified exactly. mosquitoes. Exactly. And so they engineered this fungus. It's actually Metarhizium pingsensi. Mm-hmm. Okay. They engineered it to produce a... <laughs> EPA approved, the US EPA approved What's calcium that? activated potassium and voltage gated calcium blocker. It's called uh, Epsilon Kappa Hexatoxin HV1A hybrid. <laughs> Which was derived from what? A, uh, an Australian spider. Probably it's a, ven- at, it's a venom. Tree. Probably at track. You know about the old lady who swallowed a spider? I do, I do. I don't know why. <laughs> she swallowed a fly. No, but um, perhaps, perhaps she'll die. <laughs> you guys I don't know why. <laughs> so the, the, this is from a spider. It's a venom yes, component. It is. Yeah. It is. And it's probably from Atrax, which is the uh, wow. funnel web spider of, South, of uh, Australia. It's a, it's a vicious spider. It's really hideous to look at. It's huge. It's almost as big as your hand. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't have any hairs on it like a tarantula. And it it pursues its, it's victims. A naked spider. It is, and it pursues its victims, and it has huge fangs, not just big will it, fangs. Will it pursue you? If you got close to their nest during the mating season, huh. absolutely, it would bite you. Yes, and it would get a necrotic bite. I guess uh, it's worse than that. It's hemolytic. It's all kinds of other toxins, huh. neurotoxins, and you die. It's there was, people. Yeah, there was adults, an, I was people say have there was died an old from lady. this. <laughs> That's why the book came from. She died from the spider. Well, it's you can laugh about that if you want, but if you go to Australia and you mention not it, laughing. nobody, nobody I'm not laughs. laughing. Nobody's don't, laughing. Listen, don't get us wrong, listeners. We're not laughing. That's right. 
So there were some <laughs> tragic cases, like, for instance, on Bondi Beach. I spent six months down there, so I heard about these stories. They, in fact, they have a national lab to collect the spiders to make the antivenom to make sure that mm. there's enough of it so that okay. people that are bitten can get treated. So this fungus was previously engineered to produce this venom. Right. And in the lab, they showed that this kills mosquitoes faster and with fewer spores. That's how they exactly. feed the mosquitoes. They exactly. make spores than wild-type fungus. And so here they do an environmental a field trial, yeah, which is pretty cool. Well, a controlled right? field trial. <laughs> it's a, and they did this in Burkina Faso, right? Yes, yes. And you've been there, I know. No. Because you have a big poster in your office. No, no, no. That's that's. that's What's that? That's Bhutan. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's a little bit further away from Bhutan. <laughs> have you been, uh, Daniel, to Burkina Faso? I, you know, I can never tell these things on the air because then when I present a case, people will like be able to guess ahead. <laughs> All right. Of time. Okay. No problem. No problem. We got that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. I was going to say, you know, it, it is what I like here is it is interesting to you know it it's horrible, right? That there are um, all these venomous. Um, insects and you know, snakes, et cetera. Or arthropods et cetera. But, in this case. Um, yeah, arthropods. But it's, you know, what's really tremendous here is you're taking that knowledge, you're taking that technology, and you're trying to apply it right. um, to a situation where, you know, right, right now, every single year, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are dying, mostly children, yes. of malaria. And here is potentially taking this this toxin um, and and try to use it to address this. Um, you know, this is this is a humanitarian crisis. That's right. Over eight million cases of malaria in Burkina Faso in 2017. Right. So they use these things called mosquito spheres. Right. It's a contained semi field facility. And I'm not sure if I get it, but here's what they say: It's a the sphere has six compartments four of which contain WHO experimental huts for West Africa, sugar sources for mosquitoes, and breeding sites, which are plastic sheets buried in soil. And this is all enclosed in a greenhouse frame with walls of mosquito netting. It's like Biosphere 2 is for you know, studying the ecology. So here. it's basically open so the mosquitoes can... Oh, no, it's not it's, open. It's all closed in, in but a it's mosquito like... mosquito netting. It's got all of the components of a village. It takes, Indoors, it takes a village, doesn't it? It takes a village, and they let them. Right. They put their mosquitoes inside, right? So they have insecticide resistant Anopheles caluzzi yeah. mosquitoes from their uh, collection. Yes. They're collected as larvae. Oh, from local breeding sites, they're reared to adulthood yeah. in a compartment of the sphere, and then they do the experiment. So the mosquitoes are contained within the sphere because of the netting, but they're essentially open to the environmental conditions. That's correct. Right? They have a lot of room to move around and rather than a cage of mosquitoes. But there's a curious twist to this, too. How did they collect those uh, insecticide-resistant mosquitoes? They got me, Dixon. It was easy. They just went outside and collected because they were all resistant. <laughs> they're all resistant. And how did they get resistant? By using, but Because people overuse insecticides. Right? No, no, no. They, they didn't overuse them. They did exactly what WHO said. Uh -huh. You take your mosquito netting and you impregnate it with the insecticide and then you dry it and then you sleep under it and you'll be fine. And what's happened over the period of time that that recommendation yeah. has been out is the mosquitoes went from non-resistant to resistant. But isn't mosquito netting enough? Why do you have to put insecticide in it? Because otherwise the mosquitoes are still alive and they're still going to be – and every now and then you have to get up to pee and you have to – little kids get out of the nets and a, a lot of bad things happen when you go outside that net. And you would you would love the, for the mosquitoes to die when they landed on the net. I think you should just electrify it. <laughs> That'd be great. If <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, yeah. have you slept? On, yeah, you have, of course. So I, yeah, so I, you know, yeah. Whenever I travel, sleeping. and it's and it's interesting. So a couple things I was going to say. So when I travel, um, I've been in places. I was in a malaria research station on. It was northern Thailand. It was up by the uh, Burma border, mm. and I was looking for. It was this concrete structure. I was trying to figure out where do I hang my mosquito net because there's really nowhere to hang it. Um, but there was kind of a crack up near the roof. So what I did is I actually just hung the mosquito <laughs> net on the wall, um, and it was insect, mm. you know, insecticide impregnated. And it was, you know, my view was I was doing my residual um, spraying approach, right, where I had basically. Right. Because the interesting thing, as we read about um, in mosquito behavior, is the mosquitoes like to not just bite, but they like to land, bite, land again, and so they 
they like to land on ceilings. They like to land on walls. So even if you don't have the ability to get under your net to put that up, you take advantage of this hopping behavior of the Anopheles females. And they prefer dark surfaces, as it turns out. Hmm. Yes. They're attracted to dark. So these, um, well, you'll get to the story. Sorry, yeah, and I, I, go ahead. And I was going to say before, um, is I'm going to recommend people go go online, Google, um, and if you put in WHO mosquito sphere, you can see some images of these mosquito spheres. And, you know, picture a giant um, greenhouse structure, but instead of the glass, it's just covered in this this white um, mosquito netting um, to keep them all in size. Wow, it's, it's kind big. of wild. It's big. Yeah, it is big. Huge. These That's things right. are huge they are yeah, i think it's sphere and it's this little thing. it's like a micro environment it's it's equivalent to the biosphere 2 uh, yeah. approach to looking at the ecology um it looks like a greenhouse except it has mosquito netting yeah exactly, but, uh, exactly. i meant to say that the, the where this study was done in university of maryland they have a vaccine and, center there too and this is the, the department of entomology yes and uh the uh, institut de recherche en sciences de la santé in uh, Burkina Faso. Okay. So they did the cool thing that they did here. They made one of the fung the wild type fungus red and the hyper, the, the venom producing <laughs> fungus green by putting fluorescent proteins in them. Right. And then they could monitor uptake of these by the, uh, mm-hmm. by the um, mosquitoes. And they spread this fungus in oil on black cotton sheets. Sesame oil. Oh, so you said they like black. They do. Well, that's what they said. So I just, quoted them sesame oil <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> and so they hang up these uh, sheets in the in the sphere right right and then that will attract the mosquitoes that will land on this so they put a calf inside right to to allow them something to feed on they do Probably this two much. or three nights you know that's right they put calves inside so it's interesting that these mosquitoes <laughs> have biting preferences which are outside the sphere of just humans mm-hmm. there are some that or almost 90%, if there's not a human there, I'm not going to feed. And there are others that say, well, what's ever there, I'll just feed on that. Mm-hmm. And so that's considered. Uh, so every night they release 100 female mosquitoes into the hut right. at dusk. They, and then they feed on the calf. And they collect them the next morning and monitor fungal infections, which they can do by yes, fluorescence. That's right. And they did seven of these things. Right. And they rotated the cloths. Between each compartment. Yeah, yeah. And they collected 2,402 mosquitoes. They recorded their feeding status and location right. of capture. Um, most of them were caught on the black cloth, 43%. The second common place was the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> Remember I told you I was, my only experience in a malaria area where I really had to worry was in Kenya. And uh, you look on the wall, and if the mosquito is parallel to the wall, it's not going to be an anopheline mosquito, right? It's going to be a mm-hmm. killicine. Mm-hmm. Anopheline's so, go up at an angle. About a 45-degree angle for most of the species. Now, is the ceiling because it's warmer up there? No. Don't know. Don't know. Matter. Don't know. Of the mosquitoes recaptured the next morning, 93% had, had fed on blood. Right. And that was the same throughout. So, And they said... They showing they weren't repulsed from the black sheets. Mm-hmm. Um, now, uh, what about the fungus? Most of them picked up both fungi. You know, there was no preference for one fungus or the right, other. Right, about yeah. the same. I think at about seventy five percent. And then they take a sample of the mosquitoes and wash them and plate them out to count uh, the, the colony forming units of of uh, whatever. I guess the fungus, right? Yeah. So what happened? Well, the uh, the ones that ate fungus had shorter lifespans than un- uninfected mosquitoes. So there was a control experiment here. Two different fungi and un- uninfected. So remember, the mosquitoes don't feed on blood. They feed yeah, right. on plant nectars or they feed on some sweet substances. Is that what the sesame oil yes, is? Yes, exactly right. And so they don't... So. Yeah, they'll all feed on that. 
So but I guess they, yeah, but I guess I'm going to say they, you know, they comment in this experiment that um, 93.2 percent were blood fed. So we're, we're obviously studying female. Yeah, they're mosquitoes. all female. Exactly, it's, exactly, it's exactly. They're all female. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, but that's a good point. Yeah, the the females are going to blood feed um, so that they can have an an egg um, production, where the males are the males don't blood feed. No, Ma- males just have sap because they are. Yeah, they both. They, no, they both eat the same food. Right, they both eat for sap, yeah. They both eat food. All right, so what happened? The um, infected mosquitoes had significantly shorter lifespans than uninfected mosquitoes. Right. And those that got the fungus with the venom were, were dying faster than the ones with just plain fungus. The flagon with the dragon at the yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say they do they have a nice figure where they have they're basically three lines. And it was it's, really clear cut. Yeah, I mean, yeah. was, so you know the control ones you know they're most of them are living out to the two weeks. I think we talked about in the beginning of the dry season and beginning of the rainy season mosquitoes live two three weeks not very long as opposed to we mentioned before the sand fly we say weeks meaning like Yep. Three months, That's so, right. you know, 12, 14 weeks. And so they stopped their experiments at 14 days. And you see at that point that the the hybrid fed ones, you only have about a 25% survival. Um, you're seeing that the fungus is doing pretty well, even without the hybrid gene, but it exactly. takes a lot longer for it to kill them. But the controls, you, know, you still got, you know, 80, 90% are still alive at that 14 days. So pretty dramatic impact on just the first endpoint, which is mosquito survival. Correct. But the, there's time, even with the ones that don't have the altered spores, to transmit malaria before they die from it. That's Whereas the one that issue, eats yeah. the toxin, mm-hmm. they don't have time to do that. They die within two days or three days after they eat it. And so that mm-hmm. it's usually not enough time to transmit. Yeah, you're at a 50% kill within the first week with yeah. the uh, hybrid fungus. So that's, you know. That's remain, that's brilliant. Then they wanted to know how would this fungus affect the generational control of the population. Right. So then they took 1,000 males and 500 females, and they put them in the compartment. They gave them calves for blood meals, and they monitored for how many larvae and pupae and new adults were made. Um, and then they looked at um, the effect of having the fungus on this little ecosystem. Right. And basically, the both fungi collapsed the population. So this was my favorite part. Yeah, me and, too. Uh, me too. And part, part of my favorite part is... I you know I don't I don't know if our listeners are that familiar with the uh, the sexual habits of mosquitoes. <laughs> and uh, so, is this a topic that maybe we have to defer to midnight or something? <laughs> del- very delicate topic. You, you know, I was thinking about this. Like, you know, we give that warning. You know, this is we're going to be discussing uh, the sexual habits of mosquitoes. So right. if you're below a certain age, you may want to cover right. your ears. That's right. uh, you guys are already using the S word early on, so I think we've already filtered out. Uh, these sensitive ears, but it's an interesting issue. Uh, This is, I think, one of the reasons I love infectious disease is that you don't have to stay with any confines. You can, you can learn as much as you want and claim that it's, you know, work related. And the way that mosquitoes have sex, um, what we seem to know about it is there's this swarm aspect to mosquito sex. Yes, there are. are. And so you you need a, as they say here, a sufficient number of males to create a swarm. These swarms occur for only about 20 to 30 minutes at a certain time in the evening, right? So if you you miss this, you miss this. You're not going to see it till the next day. And and the mosquito swarms form over certain... um, We'll say features on the ground, usually dark colored features. You can sort of figure out an area. Oh, that's the place where the mosquitoes are swarming and cover it with a white sheet. And now they won't swarm there anymore. Right. And the males swarm at a certain height. So the approaching females see the mosquitoes against the horizon. So the height of the swarm yeah. is affected by the visualization of the horizon. It's It's centered over something on the ground. And then the females, and this is still an area of active investigation will on some basis select the certain males within which to have copula and they have copula while in flight. So the, the females go in, um, select a male, come back out in copula. Hmm. And so it's, it's a very um, interesting, fascinating yep. um, phenomenon. And they used virgin mosquitoes for this. Sure. So I guess to the, be sure that they're going to do mosquitoes well, mate more than once, Daniel? So, so that's interesting. Female uh-huh. mosquitoes only mate once. Uh-huh. Male mosquitoes 
can mate several times. This is true. So I actually have my name on a paper <laughs> yeah. written back in the 1970s, <laughs> which in which that was discovered by a wonderful medical entomologist at the University of Notre Dame, uh, George Craig, uh, and colleagues. And I was one of them because that was the year I graduated, but I had a, a three-month hiatus uh, before going on to my postdoc. So I stayed at Notre Dame during the summer and worked on this project with George Craig. And it turns out that the males produce something in their um, seminal fluid, mm. which once mated with that female mosquito, it closes off the, the birth pore. <clears throat> and even though she will mate again, no sperm get through mm -hmm. to fertilize the female so that the first male seals the deal. And that's known as a mate. It's known as matron. We named this compound matron. It was a very high molecular weight compound. Mm -hmm. It was about 300,000 molecular weight. And if you inject it into female mosquitoes that have never mated before, it has the same effect. And so you can prove that that's what's actually at, at work. Uh, for uh, the mating behavior, at least for the for the results of the mating, not the mating behavior, but but the results of the mating. This is what closes off that pore and prevents the sperm from getting through. Mm. Yeah, that's actually that's a good point you make, Dixon, because I think people may step away from this with some sort of moral, you know, <laughs> idea, you know, like, oh, see those men, just like you know, but uh, the the females might enter into the copula act but it's been closed off so that there's correct. no actual uh, copulation occurring. And this is one of the things that people have tried to take advantage of in some of the other approaches where they yep. um, release sterile males That's right. that can still create the same impact. Basically, every time one of these sterile males has copula with one of the females, the female now can't go on to produce eggs because that's right, that's this right. blockage occurs, but yet there's no fertilization. Yeah. So. so they have controlled some medically important insects this way. And the screw fly is one of those mm -hmm. things that they've done this with. And, and it's worked extremely successfully in some places. Yeah, Ellen Dove's relative was involved. Yeah, that's in right. That. That's right. That's right. So this is a lovely experiment, which is, unfortunately, you can't see the picture, but they do three... Uh, yes. Experiments where they're measuring the number of and the arrow adults flags and, are incredibly and, and small. different um, different uh, larval stages. They count each one. So you have an initial burst as the first round of mating uh, gives rise to offspring, and then the population declines, and then you have a second burst. However, uh, in the in the mosquitoes with the wild type fungus. It's all pushed down. You still have two bursts, but they're much lower than exactly. the untreated mosquitoes. Exactly. But then the one treated with the fungus with the venom, right. you get one low burst and then nothing. Boom, it crashes. They ended up with 13 mosquitoes in that It crashed. Batch. So yeah. it really impacts uh, reproductive. Quite, quite remarkable. Po collapsed population. Yes. They also make this interesting uh, comment that th these mosquitoes with this venom fungus, um, they... Uh, larvae appear earlier than larvae from uninfected controls. And they say that sometimes dying mosquitoes can bring forward the overposition schedule to compensate for reduced chances of future oh, reproduction. And they think that's what's happening here. And they say this is the first evidence that transgene expression can induce an increased terminal investment response, How which could that? potentially undermine transgenic control approaches by affecting the evolution of infected mosquitoes. I'll be darned. That was quite interesting. Mm. Yes, three. Average MP hybrid infected female laid 26 eggs with only three developing into adults. So they are, they are laying fewer poor quality eggs than untreated mosquitoes. Right. And um, so- they don't, don't, they don't go into the mechanism, though, do they? No. Well, this is a, this is a, a venom, right? And it blocks. It's a calcium ion channel yeah, blocker. Yeah. Right? So these mosquitoes obviously have the channels, right? Sure. And they are blocked. Sure. Yeah, there's some earlier work on that because this, I mean, this um, field trial was built upon, you know, years of, of research where they, I think mm -hmm. back in 2013, there was a big mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so here we are. Now we've sort of gotten to this point. And does it work? And wow, right. pretty impressive. Does it? <laughs> they, also, impressive. They, they also say this is um, specific for mosquitoes. There's no. Uh, it's human specific. Yeah, right. So the, the narrow host range of this fungus, right. which has been tested against other uh, insects, 
it's really limited to mosquitoes, so exactly. it's not going to go making other insects, which may be beneficial Plus, killing them. Plus, they right? don't even give it in a way that would allow it to go that way because they they include it into the sesame oil and they paint that on these black surfaces. All right, so now this is a this is a sphere. But what? Let's say they they agree that this works. Oh, by the way, this uh, this neurotoxin. I think I said this. It was recently approved by the EPA to control uh, lepidopteran pests. Ah, mm -hmm. gypsy so, moths and stuff. So it's approved already. So mm -hmm. let's say this wants this is going to be used. How would you do this in the field? Not as an experiment, but where would you put this? Where would you oh. put this fungus in people's houses? Yes, really. Yes, yes. you'd you'd probably paint it on the window cells. Uh, I don't want fungus in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you want this one. You want this one. This is not going to cause a rot in your uh, your foundation or anything. This is just going to sit there and wait for a mosquito to come along. I'm not sure you're going to paint it on the on Well, the where else would you so. put it? I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. Well, that's what I told you, and then you would object to that. <laughs> but look, you know- You might I, object to the fact that it's an altered in my travels, fungus. In my travels in Europe, I have seen the flypapers hanging <laughs> that's from right. restaurant ceilings. So maybe they'll make flypaper with the fungus on it. It could be. All right. Daniel, what do you think? How is this going to be deployed? Yeah, so I, I I really enjoyed the the anti fungus because people don't like fungus, right? You know, people are like I got mold in my. That's right. That's right. I had a patient last week, you know, and and we're trying to choose the correct potentially life saving antibiotic, and I say it says here that you're allergic to penicillin. What's the story? He goes, you know, I always like have bad allergies. I'm allergic to mold, and since penicillin comes from mold, I I don't ever take that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, well, hmm. <laughs> let's not withhold the life saving antibiotics here. But people don't like the idea that you're gonna, you know, spray their house with mold. Hang right? on a second. <laughs> if, if they thought about it just a little bit further, they wouldn't eat cheese, they wouldn't drink beer, they wouldn't do a lot of things that have something to do with fungi. So no, I and I no, I actually appreciate that, Dixon, for jumping in. I mean here, you gotta, <laughs> here here's an area where eight you know, this country, eight million people a year are getting sick with malaria. Right. Uh, you know, the sensibilities there might no, be a little gonna bit have that different there. than you're going to find in, you know. We'll right. say. So you're going to put this inside the house, that's mm -hmm. what you're saying? Yes. Not outside? Doesn't make any sense? Well, to put no. it, it does well, need to be inside. And this is one of the quality controls, I'll say, is that the spores are incredibly ultraviolet light sensitive. That's right. So, so they are that's contained. Exactly I mean, right. once you bring this out into the sun, exactly the spores right. die. It's okay. all over it. Okay. So that helps from this, you know, I'm thinking about writing sure. some science fiction novel where the stuff escapes and whatever. Whatever. Right. But um, and they're thinking about that, too, and saying, you know, the nice thing we have here about this um, particular um, bio warfare approach yes. is that the spores are sensitive to ultraviolet light. This is an mm -hmm. indoor application. You might cover your nets with it, but then you can't bring them outside. So it probably is going to be more of a residual spray, residual application yeah. on wall ceilings, etc. A few scientists were not as enthusiastic as we are about this in their comments uh, for solicited. You know, science does that occasionally, and they'll they'll go out and, and ask some experts, well, what do you think of this? And what do you think of this? And, and one of them was quite clear and said that... Uh, well, it, it's a, a good finding, and it's a nice laboratory model, but I don't think it, it's going to have much application outside. Mm, I don't know. It sounds good. I'm just but I think about the you know, inside-the-house application because you need to have minute. enough to feed the mosquitoes, right? Yes, but remember yeah. how they used to apply DDT, too. They made a residual spray of DDT, and they sprayed yeah. it on the inside of the houses, and people, yeah. I don't want DDT in my house. No, 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 you do want DDT in your house because it kills yeah. the mosquitoes, right? So, Yeah, there was an interesting expert comment where they actually said one of the great things here is there might be a market for this. So you use your locally grown yes, you know, oil, right. whatever, but the that's company right. is right. selling you the fungus that, you know, adds so many drops to your, you know, can of this, sure. shake it up, sure. put it on your walls. And so yeah, they said that's one of the challenges when you try to introduce these things. It's like people are only willing to donate so much cash. So if you can create something that, that could work within a market economy, then, right. you know, so – that's, you know, if, if this is considered, and of course, all the, is this safe or all the risks being considered? Because, uh, yeah, you don't want to have unforeseen, untoward consequences. Uh, but then again, as I always like to point out, we're in the middle of a humanitarian crisis with hundreds of thousands of children dying every year. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when you balance the risks and benefits, this, this has legs in that sense. 
It has legs. All right. Now, the next thing on our agenda is a hero. Okay. Yes. Daniel, so, and I, I think you have a hero for us. I'm going to jump in. And this is this is a hero from Parasitic Diseases 7th Edition. Ah. Uh, this is Vina Tandon, um, born in 1949. Uh, and she is an Indian parasitologist. And I'm going to read our little description here. I say, an Indian parasitologist whose contribution to science was acknowledged by the government of India, awarding her the Padma Shri their fourth highest civilian honor. Dr. Tandon is credited as the chief inve- in instigator of the Northeast India Helminth Parasite Information Database, hmm. a critical database of parasite biodiversity for this region, and is the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Indian Society of Parasitology for her work on helminths. Dr. Tandon has delivered many keynote addresses and has authored many texts and articles. And I think she serves as a another great mentor for budding parasitologists. Mm-hmm. Hmm. All right. Great. Let's do a couple of emails. There you go. Justin writes, he sends in a link to a Washington Post article. She went to the hospital for an infection. Doctors found four bees living in her eye, eating her tears. Now... Hmm. Yeah, so she's a 29-year-old. Her eye was swollen shut. It was painful. And This is a Taiwanese lady. Went to the hospital. They found four bees uh, in underneath her um, Eyelid? eyelids. Yep. That's so, not- so, Dixon, this would be an ectoparasite? I don't think it's a parasite at all. No? <laughs> bees are not parasitic at, in any level. Okay. This is just a rare occurrence. It's right? an odd thing to have happen. That's right. So it made headline news right. in the Washington Post. And then William wants to send share his story about schistosomiasis. He believes that it is sexually transmitted. Schistosomiasis hematobium. And he has a website, schistosomiasis.co. So we'll, we'll just let everyone go and check that out. Is schistosomiasis sexually transmitted? No. Dixon is frowning. Definitely frowning. The only way you can catch schistosomiasis is by swimming in fresh water and being penetrated by saccharae, which are shed from infected snails. That's the route yeah, in which it's spread. So, so William has made his own website where he claims that transmission can be accomplished during intercourse without exposure to fresh water infected. Blah blah blah. You story. know what I say to that? <laughs> bah humbug. Yeah, yeah, you're the, you're the expert. <laughs> well, not an expert, but I've been reading about this parasite most of my adult life, and that just doesn't make any right. sense. I could, think it's fake news. Can you take Christine's email, Dixon? Sure. Can you find it? I got it right here, sir. Christine writes, hello, doctors de Pommier and Dr. Racaniello. Sorry, Daniel. Um, I sent an email before, but I'm pretty sure I sent it to some wrong email address. Lots of luck. Like some of our- No, that's laughing out loud. Oh, I see. <laughs> Lots of, <laughs> LOL. Like some of your dedicated listeners, I have no degrees in any of the subjects you discuss, but I do have a strong passion for learning about parasites, viruses, and bacteria. Actually, I just love learning, whether it's diseases, all subjects regarding space, history, or nature. I discovered my interest when I started watching Monsters Inside Me and thought it was pretty neat that Dixon was the consultant for the show that got my passion started. I work as a receptionist, and since I found TWIP, I have been listening to you guys every day, eight hours a day while I'm working, and when I get home, and obsessed, although I'm not allowed to listen to Wait, 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 you skipped the line. Oh, no, my boyfriend is pretty good about my obsession. When I get home, when I get home, you skipped the line, dude. When I get home. And and when I get home and start making dinner and Mm -hmm. cleaning, I pick up where I left off at work. My boyfriend is pretty good about my obsession, although I'm not allowed to listen to you guys while we're eating dinner. That's a lot of listening to TWIP, isn't it? It's a lot of listening. I haven't gotten too far into TWIV and TWIM, as I am totally digging TWIP right now. (laughs) You guys are really great together, and I find myself chuckling quite often. I find you both (laughs) very entertaining as well as informative. My personal favorite parasite is the zombie parasites who commandeer the host to complete their life cycle. It seriously creeps me out, but equally fascinates me. 
I'm hoping there's an episode or two or three dedicated to these amazing creatures. I don't have any clever questions or comments to make. I just wanted to email you guys and send my love for both of you. Sorry, Daniel. And to the shows. <laughs> Keep it up. <clears throat> this is a soul candy for me, and you make my work life so much more enjoyable. Love, peace, and chicken grease from Edmonton, Canada. So I think that um, Christine has not reached the point where Daniel joined us, right? She's that's, that's what oh, I'm This thinking. is an old email. Okay, fine. Well, it's not so old, but she's listening through from the beginning. I got it. I got it. I got it. Well, she's a receptionist. I got it. I, got I can it. imagine people come in and okay. she has to stop. And no, that's right. Like, <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Daniel, can you take... Uh, What's the next one? S- certainly. Christine, yeah. make sure you write back once you discover me, when you get up to the present. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Jim writes, Dear Twiptosporidia Academicus, nice. <laughs> today is a coolish day here in Vancouver, but the sun is shining. It is great to be getting back to your podcast after a while away. Are you planning to do a paper or a program on parasites and climate change? Mm-hmm. I know you were thinking of inviting Peter Hotez. Maybe that would be an interesting topic. The Twix podcasts are always in the zone. Take care, Jim. Cool. Yeah, we were talking about doing climate change with Peter Hotez, right? We could. Is that up his alley? I'm not sure. I actually can't say. I know that. I, I, I think so, right? I mean, I mean he wrote that, yeah. We, we all try to pay attention to articles that do link the two things together. And mostly, I think it's mostly associated with vector-borne infections because mm-hmm. of where they can live. Peter is more of a soil-based uh, geohelminth person, so I don't know whether he's um, as knowledgeable in that area or not, but we can certainly find out. All right, so then just two quick ones. Chris, uh, actually, this is an old email about um, mm. a previous case, so I'll just say I received my signed copy of PD6 in the mail, have been enjoying it thoroughly. I find myself reaching for it. Whenever I need a quick reference or a refresher on a life cycle, I even referenced it for this case. And this was the case of oh. Toxo. I think this was the eye. Yeah, unilateral vision impairment. Yeah, that's right. All right so we'll, I won't read this, but it's in the show notes. And then the last one is from Anne who writes, Yikes, how I got <laughs> infected by a bot flying sends a link to a video. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Yikes is right. All right. Uh, now for the final act of this multi-act podcast. We have a new case study. Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Daniel, what have you got for us now? All right. Uh, This is, this is a little long, a little long HPI here, but uh, this is fresh. It is, it is is worth. I like this one. This is a good, uh, this we're, we're going to be discussing the case of a retired United States Navy physician who lives aboard his sailboat, <laughs> and he has just finished. This isn't me. I'm never in the Navy, and I'm also, I don't think I'll ever retire. <laughs> but he has just finished doing some remote medical um, volunteer work in Central America, and he is now docked in a harbor in the Dominican Republic when he has the, um, he says, the the rather sudden onset of dull and progressively worsening epigastric and lower abdominal pain. Uh, he then proceeds to feel to feel chilled. Um, he just feels like he couldn't get warm. And then over the next 12 hours, the pain intensifies to the point where he says he is near tears. And he actually took a ride hail, an Uber, to a local medical center in the Dominican Republic. Uh, he ends up getting it. He ends up getting admitted. Uh, they give him IV hydration. They give him so some probiotics, and they note that he um, he is febrile. Uh, he has an elevated white blood cell count to um, twenty thousand. Normal would be ten, but he's up at twenty thousand. His platelets are a little bit low, and his white count has what we've previously referred to as a left shift. Um, he says that associated with this, he has um, initially some constipation where he feels like he's got to go to the bathroom, but nothing's coming out. And then he does have some diarrhea, um, and he thinks there may have been some blood in the diarrhea. Um, he eventually gets discharged without really being diagnosed, um, but a little more hydrated. He continues to have fevers of 103, still having chills. He gets a little bit of a rash with um, – I saw photos of this rash, rose-colored spots on his torso. Um, 
at this point, um, I get involved in the case. And uh, he initially starts with a three-day three day course of azithromycin, um, but the symptoms continue. And then um, it's recommended that he start taking metronidazole. And he takes his first dose of metronidazole, and after about two to three hours, he starts to feel better. And as he completes his course of metronidazole, the fevers go away, the abdominal pain goes away, and his symptoms completely resolve. Hmm. All right. Just, we have a resolution, but in the end of the, the whole thing is right here. It's over. <laughs> yes, but we, we don't have the diagnosis, and there may be some interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to, you guys, you know, have any questions? What might we want to know about? All right. So this guy lives on his sailboat. So he lives on his sailboat. He's a live aboard guy. He travels around the world living on his sailboat. And he eats all the time on his sailboat, or does he go into town for restaurant food? Yeah, that's interesting that you bring that up. Are you worried that he may have caught this from someone? There may have been someone that he, uh, is there anyone else who was sick? So he he sometimes eats on his sailboat and he actually has a bunch of local um, individuals that are um, working on the on the sailboat. So he sometimes, you know, eats stuff there. He also goes into town to eat. Is he Is he by himself? He's not married, right? No, he's married and his wife lives with him on the sailboat. I see. And he doesn't go offshore to do. And she any, didn't get sick. He doesn't go offshore to do any um, activities that might increase his uh, chances of being infected. In so I'll way. answer. I'll answer both questions. So um, his um, his wife is completely fine, um, and she had actually stayed there on the sailboat in the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. while he was off doing his remote medical work in Central America. And he had just returned from that remote medical work um, about two weeks before, two to three weeks before he started to not feel well. Uh -huh. Right. So he got sick when so he was off boat. Huh? The, the really interesting part of your case history, Dr. Griffin, yes, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, relates to making a short list and a long list of organisms that are treatable with metronidazole first. Mm -hmm. That would be one way of doing it. And if you do that, and you're doing this for eukaryotic parasitic infections, because we know that metronidazole also kills off all the anaerobes mm -hmm. from bacterial infections as well. So we're going to rule that out first by saying this is a TWIP program. So this is TWIP. So yep. Damn this the bacteria. You have TWIM. You can talk about this one on TWIM if you want. <laughs> but, this is TWIM. So I don't know too many parasites where metronidazole is a recommended drug of choice. I'm not going to go down that list now because I think that would be unfair of me to make that differential diagnosis without first hearing from our listeners. Yes. That's, that's, that's what my mind is going through right now. I have a very short Rolodex for metronidazole. And um, so and I can imagine it producing this kind of a pattern of illness as well. Uh, Daniel, does this guy have sex when he goes offshore? Um, you know, he's living with his wife, so it's um, basically just Probably with not. his wife. Because yeah. he spends two months doing this stuff, right? But he's traveling with her. I so he's traveling, he's traveling with his wife. He had just gone off for um, a couple weeks to do the remote weeks. medical care. Yeah, so he stays um, offshore by himself for a couple of weeks, but he's he's not doing anything. Definitely. No, there was okay. Yeah, there was no. I will say no high risk uh, no sexual high risk exposure, behavior. no drug no, use, yeah. right? No, no drug use. Not a smoker. Actually, a very healthy guy. Does he drink? Um, actually, very limited amount. He's so, a navy uh, guy. Come I, on, I think that's. You know, I, I'm not sure why they left him in because a I don't. Rum a day. He, he, yeah, I don't think he drinks as much as you know. I think is required among the sailors. That's right. Okay. Very good. I'm gonna throw. I'm gonna throw another thing, and this is something please, we always ask please. when someone gets, um, I'll say, a gastrointestinal um, problem. Is we'll ask them, um, you know, has anyone else been sick? And you asked about his wife, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm gonna say that I, I asked a little bit more. I said, yeah, I really want to know a little bit more. Maybe you could have gotten this from someone, you know. You, and he mentioned, you know what? The there were three men that were working um, on his boat. One of them prior to him getting sick, had a um, an issue with bloody diarrhea. Uh -huh. And then he reports that he always keep like sort of a bowl of uh, nuts, peanuts, things like that around. 
<laughs> the man was eating, you know, and then he was scooped, you know, some as well. So there may have been some connection there. I'm just going to throw a little bit more. And how long ago was that before he got sick? Sometime before. We're gonna, Some gonna leave, time. We're going to leave that Sometime. vague. Yeah. People can start See, thinking uh, about the timing of things. What's remarkable is the rapidity of which his symptoms disappeared after taking the drug. Mm. I'm impressed with that. I'm sorry Daniel had to volunteer the nut bowl because we could have done a little more questioning about eating. I was trying yeah. to get into okay. eating, okay. but... Okay. Um, or sources of, of obvious yeah, contamination. So, so these three gentlemen who work on his boat, do they cook for him? No, they don't cook for him, but they were working and apparently sharing some of the, the food that you grab with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, what do they need three guys on the boat to do, Daniel? What What is this involved? <laughs> you know, that's the issue with sailboats. It is, as we say, <laughs> a hole in the water <laughs> Labor. which one throws their money. Money, that's yes. Right, that's so, right, that's right. Okay. How big a boat? How many feet? Um, I think it's about a 40-foot boat. So it's a, it's a nice size boat. And she's got a main mast and a, and a jib probably, right? Yeah, I think it's just a sloop. I should have him send me a picture. I'll send. I'll send a picture. Maybe we can post it. Cool. Okay. <laughs> now, very good. That's great. Yep. Nice case. Okay. That is TWIP one seven two. Let's make a calculation. In a year, you'll be eighty. <laughs> That's true. I and will. if we do two a month, that is um, twenty four episodes, right? And uh, oh, we'll for be... six, that would be over two hundred. That's right. So twenty four one seventy two plus twenty four is uh, one ninety six, right? Yeah. So we could push it and make two hundred on your birthday. <laughs> that would be. Wouldn't that ask, be fun? I would be asking for too much, but that gives me a reason to live. And we could do it in front of an audience. <laughs> we could rent a theater. You want to do that in New York? Oh, you would. And then that. five people would come. Five at least. <laughs> it would be fun. All right, you can find TWIP at microbe.tv slash TWIP. There you will find the show notes, the letters, etc. Most of you listen on your phone using a podcast player. Please subscribe. That way we know how many people are listening. We don't know who you are. That's fine. It's a little creepy. We don't need to know that. But <laughs> we want to know how many. And if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can give as little as $1 a month. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. And for a buck, which is... You know, you can't do anything with a buck. You might as well give it to us. There you go. And for that, you're going to get amazing science. As someone said today, we set the standard for science podcasts. You're here. We set the standard for excellence in science podcasting. I have to put that on the website somewhere in a prominent place. Setting the standard for excellence in science podcasting. Microbe.tv slash contribute. So if you want to contribute to science, excellence in science podcasting, microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin's at Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. We should mention that over at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, not only do we have the seventh edition, which you could download for free or purchase via Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. We also have a brand new page called Paul Has Measles. And there you can find Paul Has Measles, a children's book about viruses and vaccines in many languages. Right. It's free downloads or in a few languages you could go buy a little book on uh, Amazon. They're not very expensive and they're kind of nice for a little kid to have, right? Yeah, more than just nice. And, and Daniel, we're going to be putting up uh, another reading set of reading materials, correct? Yes, our limited uh, resource medical care handbook, uh, the the one basically that uh, Dixon and I are creating a bunch of videos for to right. people that are interested go out and doing global health. This will give them a inexpensive, actually free book as well. Very as, inexpensive. Uh, right. bu bunch of very free, inexpensive. Free, free, free lectures as well. So, that's yes. Right. That's right. And we'll make a separate page for that. Be great. great. All right. Dixon de Palmier, also at parasiteswithoutborders.com, but trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. And yeah. it's an amazing set of websites you have there, Dixon. Fun stuff. Without you, I couldn't do it. Thank you, Dixon. Welcome, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank Ronald Jenkins for the music and ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP. Is, is parasitic. parasitic.